A civilization or civilization see English spelling differences is any complex society characterized by urban development, social stratification imposed by a cultural elite, symbolic systems of communication for example, writing systems, and a perceived separation from and domination over the natural environment. Civilizations are intimately associated with and often further defined by other socio-politico-economic characteristics, including centralization, the domestication of both humans and other organisms, specialization organization of labor, culturally ingrained ideologies of progress and supremacism, monumental architecture, taxation, societal dependence upon farming and expansionism. Historically, civilization has often been understood as a larger and more advanced culture, in contrast to smaller, supposedly primitive cultures. Similarly, some scholars have described civilization as being necessarily multicultural. In this broad sense, a civilization contrasts with non-centralized tribal societies, including the cultures of nomadic pastoralists, Neolithic societies or hunter-gatherers, but it also contrasts with the cultures found within civilizations themselves. As an uncountable noun, civilization also refers to the process of a society developing into a centralized, urbanized, stratified structure. Civilizations are organized in densely populated settlements divided into hierarchical social classes with a ruling elite and subordinate urban and rural populations, which engage in intensive agriculture, mining, small-scale manufacture and trade. Civilization concentrates power, extending human control over the rest of nature, including over other human beings. Civilization, as its etymology below suggests, is a concept originally linked to towns and cities. The earliest emergence of civilizations is generally associated with the final stages of the Neolithic Revolution, culminating in the relatively rapid process of urban revolution and state formation, a political development associated with the appearance of a governing elite. History of the concept The English word civilization comes from the 16th century French civilisé civilized from Latin civilis, civil, related to civis, citizen, and civitas, city. The fundamental treatise is Norbert Elias's The Civilizing Process 1939, which traces social mores from medieval courtly society to the early modern period. In The Philosophy of Civilization 1923, Albert Schweitzer outlines two opinions, one purely material and the other material and ethical. He said that the world crisis was from humanity losing the ethical idea of civilization, the sum total of all progress made by man in every sphere of action and from every point of view insofar as the progress helps towards the spiritual perfecting of individuals as the progress of all progress. Adjectives like civility developed in the mid-16th century. The abstract noun, civilization, meaning civilized condition came in the 1760s, again from French. The first known use in French is in 1757, by Victor Riquetti, Marquis de Mirabeau, and the first use in English is attributed to Adam Ferguson, who in his 1767 essay on the history of civil society wrote, "...not only the individual advances from infancy to manhood, but the species itself from rudeness to civilization." The word was therefore opposed to barbarism or rudeness, in the active pursuit of progress characteristic of the Age of Enlightenment. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, during the French Revolution, civilization was used in the singular, never in the plural, and meant the progress of humanity as a whole. This is still the case in French. The use of civilizations as a countable noun was in occasional use in the 19th century, but has become much more common in the later 20th century, sometimes just meaning culture itself in origin an uncountable noun, made countable in the context of ethnography. Only in this generalized sense does it become possible to speak of a medieval civilization, which in Elias's sense would have been an oxymoron. Already in the 18th century, civilization was not always seen as an improvement. One historically important distinction between culture and civilization is from the writings of Rousseau, particularly his work about education, Emile. Here, civilization, being more rational and socially driven, is not fully in accord with human nature, and human wholeness is achievable only through the recovery of or approximation to an original prediscursive or prerational natural unity. See Noble Savage. 
From this, a new approach was developed, especially in Germany, first by Johann Gottfried Herder, and later by philosophers such as Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. This sees cultures as natural organisms, not defined by conscious, rational, deliberative acts, but a kind of pre rational folk spirit. Civilization, in contrast, though more rational and more successful in material progress, is unnatural and leads to vices of social life, such as guile, hypocrisy, envy and avarice. In World War II, Leo Strauss, having fled Germany, argued in New York that this opinion of civilization was behind Nazism and German militarism and nihilism. Topic. Characteristics Social scientists such as V. Gordon Child have named a number of traits that distinguish a civilization from other kinds of society. Civilizations have been distinguished by their means of subsistence, types of livelihood, settlement patterns, forms of government, social stratification, economic systems, literacy and other cultural traits. Andrew Nikephoric argues that, "...civilizations relied on shackled human muscle." It took the energy of slaves to plant crops, clothe emperors, and build cities, and considers slavery to be a common feature of pre modern civilizations. All civilizations have depended on agriculture for subsistence, with the possible exception of some early civilizations in Peru which may have depended upon maritime resources. Grain farms can result in accumulated storage and a surplus of food, particularly when people use intensive agricultural techniques such as artificial fertilization, irrigation and crop rotation. It is possible but more difficult to accumulate horticultural production, and so civilizations based on horticultural gardening have been very rare. Grain surpluses have been especially important because grain can be stored for a long time. A surplus of food permits some people to do things besides produce food for a living. Early civilizations included soldiers, artisans, priests, and priestesses, and other people with specialized careers. A surplus of food results in a division of labor and a more diverse range of human activity, a defining trait of civilizations. However, in some places, hunter gatherers have had access to food surpluses, such as among some of the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest and perhaps during the Mesolithic Natufian culture. It is possible that food surpluses and relatively large scale social organization and division of labor predates plant and animal domestication. Civilizations have distinctly different settlement patterns from other societies. The word civilization is sometimes simply defined as living in cities. Non-farmers tend to gather in cities to work and to trade. Compared with other societies, civilizations have a more complex political structure, namely the state. State societies are more stratified than other societies, there is a greater difference among the social classes. The ruling class, normally concentrated in the cities, has control over much of the surplus and exercises its will through the actions of a government or bureaucracy. Morton Fried, a conflict theorist and Elman Service, an integration theorist, have classified human cultures based on political systems and social inequality. This system of classification contains four categories Hunter-gatherer bands, which are generally egalitarian. Horticultural, pastoral societies in which there are generally two inherited social classes, chief and commoner. Highly stratified structures, or chiefdoms, with several inherited social classes, king, noble, freeman, serf and slave. Civilizations, with complex social hierarchies and organized, institutional governments. Economically, civilizations display more complex patterns of ownership and exchange than less organized societies. Living in one place allows people to accumulate more personal possessions than nomadic people. Some people also acquire landed property, or private ownership of the land. Because a percentage of people in civilizations do not grow their own food, they must trade their goods and services for food in a market system, or receive food through the levy of tribute, redistributive taxation, tariffs or tithes from the food-producing segment of the population. Early human cultures function through a gift economy supplemented by limited barter systems. By the early Iron Age, contemporary civilizations developed money as a medium of exchange for increasingly complex transactions. In a village, the potter makes a pot for the brewer and the brewer compensates the potter by giving him a certain amount of beer. In a city, the potter may need a new roof, the roofer may need new shoes, the cobbler may need new horseshoes, the blacksmith may need a new coat and the tanner may need a new pot. 
These people may not be personally acquainted with one another and their needs may not occur all at the same time. A monetary system is a way of organizing these obligations to ensure that they are fulfilled. From the days of the earliest monetarized civilizations, monopolistic controls of monetary systems have benefited the social and political elites. Writing, developed first by people in Sumer, is considered a hallmark of civilization and appears to accompany the rise of complex administrative bureaucracies or the conquest state. Traders and bureaucrats relied on writing to keep accurate records. Like money, writing was necessitated by the size of the population of a city and the complexity of its commerce among people who are not all personally acquainted with each other. However, writing is not always necessary for civilization, as shown the Inca civilization of the Andes, which did not use writing at all except from a complex recording system consisting of chords and nodes instead, the quipus, who still functioned as a civilized society. Aided by their division of labor and central government planning, civilizations have developed many other diverse cultural traits. These include organized religion, development in the arts, and countless new advances in science and technology. Through history, successful civilizations have spread, taking over more and more territory, and assimilating more and more previously uncivilized people. Nevertheless, some tribes or people remain uncivilized even to this day. These cultures are called by some primitive, a term that is regarded by others as pejorative. Primitive implies in some way that a culture is first, Latin equals primus, that it has not changed since the dawn of humanity, though this has been demonstrated not to be true. Specifically, as all of today's cultures are contemporaries, today's so-called primitive cultures are in no way antecedent to those we consider civilized. Anthropologists today use the term non-literate to describe these peoples. Civilization has been spread by colonization, invasion, religious conversion, the extension of bureaucratic control and trade, and by introducing agriculture and writing to non-literate peoples. Some non-civilized people may willingly adapt to civilized behavior. But civilization is also spread by the technical, material and social dominance that civilization engenders. Assessments of what level of civilization a polity has reached are based on comparisons of the relative importance of agricultural as opposed to trade or manufacturing capacities, the territorial extensions of its power, the complexity of its division of labor, and the carrying capacity of its urban centers. Secondary elements include a developed transportation system, writing, standardized measurement, currency, contractual and tort-based legal systems, art, architecture, mathematics, scientific understanding, metallurgy, political structures and organized religion. Traditionally, polities that managed to achieve notable military, ideological and economic power defined themselves as civilized. As opposed to other societies or human groupings outside their sphere of influence, calling the latter barbarians, savages, and primitives. In a modern day context, civilized people have been contrasted with indigenous people or tribal societies. <laughs> Cultural identity Civilization can also refer to the culture of a complex society, not just the society itself. Every society, civilization or not, has a specific set of ideas and customs, and a certain set of manufactures and arts that make it unique. Civilizations tend to develop intricate cultures, including a state-based decision-making apparatus, a literature, professional art, architecture, organized religion and complex customs of education, coercion and control associated with maintaining the elite. The intricate culture associated with civilization has a tendency to spread to and influence other cultures, sometimes assimilating them into the civilization a classic example being Chinese civilization and its influence on nearby civilizations such as Korea, Japan and Vietnam. Many civilizations are actually large cultural spheres containing many nations and regions. The civilization in which someone lives is that person's broadest cultural identity. Many historians have focused on these broad cultural spheres and have treated civilizations as discrete units. Early 20th century philosopher Oswald Spengler uses the German word Kultur culture, for what many call a civilization. Spengler believed a civilization's coherence is based on a single primary cultural symbol. 
Cultures experience cycles of birth, life, decline and death, often supplanted by a potent new culture, formed around a compelling new cultural symbol. Spengler states civilization is the beginning of the decline of a culture as the most external and artificial states of which a species of developed humanity is capable. This unified culture concept of civilization also influenced the theories of historian Arnold J. Toynbee in the mid-20th century. Toynbee explored civilization processes in his multi-volume A Study of History, which traced the rise and, in most cases, the decline of 21 civilizations and five arrested civilizations. Civilizations generally declined and fell, according to Toynbee, because of the failure of a creative minority through moral or religious decline, to meet some important challenge, rather than mere economic or environmental causes. Samuel P. Huntington defines civilization as the highest cultural grouping of people and the broadest level of cultural identity people have short of that which distinguishes humans from other species. Huntington's theories about civilizations are discussed below. Topic. Complex systems. Another group of theorists, making use of systems theory, looks at a civilization as a complex system, i.e., a framework by which a group of objects can be analyzed that work in concert to produce some result. Civilizations can be seen as networks of cities that emerge from pre-urban cultures and are defined by the economic, political, military, diplomatic, social and cultural interactions among them. Any organization is a complex social system and a civilization is a large organization. Systems theory helps guard against superficial but misleading analogies in the study and description of civilizations. Systems theorists look at many types of relations between cities, including economic relations, cultural exchanges and political, diplomatic, military relations. These spheres often occur on different scales. For example, trade networks were, until the 19th century, much larger than either cultural spheres or political spheres. Extensive trade routes, including the Silk Road through Central Asia and Indian Ocean Sea routes linking the Roman Empire, Persian Empire, India and China, were well established 2,000 years ago, when these civilizations scarcely shared any political, diplomatic, military, or cultural relations. The first evidence of such long-distance trade is in the ancient world. During the Uruk period, Guillermo Algues has argued that trade relations connected Egypt, Mesopotamia, Iran and Afghanistan. Resin found later in the Royal Cemetery at Ur is suggested was traded northwards from Mozambique. Many theorists argue that the entire world has already become integrated into a single world system, a process known as globalization. Different civilizations and societies all over the globe are economically, politically, and even culturally interdependent in many ways. There is debate over when this integration began, and what sort of integration, cultural, technological, economic, political, or military diplomatic, is the key indicator in determining the extent of a civilization. David Wilkinson has proposed that economic and military diplomatic integration of the Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations resulted in the creation of what he calls the Central Civilization around 1500 BCE. Central Civilization later expanded to include the entire Middle East and Europe, and then expanded to a global scale with European colonization, integrating the Americas, Australia, China, and Japan by the 19th century. According to Wilkinson, civilizations can be culturally heterogeneous, like the Central Civilization, or homogeneous, like the Japanese civilization. What Huntington calls the clash of civilizations might be characterized by Wilkinson as a clash of cultural spheres within a single global civilization. Others point to the Crusades as the first step in globalization. The more conventional viewpoint is that networks of societies have expanded and shrunk since ancient times, and that the current globalized economy and culture is a product of recent European colonialism. Topic. History The notion of world history as a succession of civilizations is an entirely modern one. In the European Age of Discovery, emerging modernity was put into stark contrast with the Neolithic and Mesolithic stage of the cultures of the New World, suggesting that the complex states had emerged at some time in prehistory. The term, civilization, 
As it is now most commonly understood, a complex state with centralization, social stratification and specialization of labor, corresponds to early empires that arise in the Fertile Crescent in the Early Bronze Age, around roughly 3000 BC. Gordon Childe defined the emergence of civilization as the result of two successive revolutions, the Neolithic Revolution, triggering the development of settled communities, and the Urban Revolution. Urban Revolution At first, the Neolithic was associated with shifting subsistence cultivation, where continuous farming led to the depletion of soil fertility resulting in the requirement to cultivate fields further and further removed from the settlement, eventually compelling the settlement itself to move. In major semi-arid river valleys, annual flooding renewed soil fertility every year, with the result that population densities could rise significantly. This encouraged a secondary products revolution in which people used domesticated animals not just for meat, but also for milk, wool, manure and pulling plows and carts, a development that spread through the Eurasian Oecumene. The earlier Neolithic technology and lifestyle was established first in Western Asia for example at Gobekli Tepe, from about 9130 BCE, and later in the Yellow River and Yangtze basins in China for example the Pengtushan culture from 7500 BCE, and later spread. Mesopotamia is the site of the earliest developments of the Neolithic Revolution from around 10,000 BCE, with civilizations developing from 6,500 years ago. This area has been identified as having inspired some of the most important developments in human history including the invention of the wheel, the development of cuneiform script, mathematics, astronomy and agriculture. Similar pre-civilized Neolithic revolutions also began independently from 7000 BCE in northwestern South America the Norte Chico civilization and Mesoamerica, the 8.2 kiloyear arid event and the 5.9 kiloyear interpluvial saw the drying out of semi-arid regions and a major spread of deserts. This climate change shifted the cost-benefit ratio of endemic violence between communities, which saw the abandonment of unwalled village communities and the appearance of walled cities, associated with the first civilizations. This «urban revolution» marked the beginning of the accumulation of transferable surpluses, which helped economies and cities develop. It was associated with the state monopoly of violence, the appearance of a soldier class and endemic warfare, the rapid development of hierarchies, and the appearance of human sacrifice. The civilized urban revolution in turn was dependent upon the development of sedentism, the domestication of grains and animals and development of lifestyles that facilitated economies of scale and accumulation of surplus production by certain social sectors. The transition from complex cultures to civilizations, while still disputed, seems to be associated with the development of state structures, in which power was further monopolized by an elite ruling class who practiced human sacrifice. Towards the end of the Neolithic period, various elitist Chalcolithic civilizations began to rise in various cradles from around 3300 BCE, expanding into large-scale empires in the course of the Bronze Age Old Kingdom of Egypt, Akkadian Empire, Assyrian Empire, Old Assyrian Empire, Hittite Empire. A parallel development took place independently in the pre-Columbian Americas, where the Mayans began to be urbanized around 500 BCE, and the fully-fledged Aztec and Inca emerged by the 15th century, briefly before European contact. Topic. Axial Age The Bronze Age collapse was followed by the Iron Age around 1200 BCE, during which a number of new civilizations emerged, culminating in a period from the 8th to the 3rd century BCE which Karl Jaspers termed the Axial Age, presented as a critical transitional phase leading to classical civilization. William Hardy MacNeill proposed that this period of history was one in which culture contact between previously separate civilizations saw the closure of the Oecumene and led to accelerated social change from China to the Mediterranean, associated with the spread of coinage, larger empires and new religions. This view has recently been championed by Christopher Chase Dunn and other world systems theorists. <laughs> Modernity 
A major technological and cultural transition to modernity began approximately 1500 CE in Western Europe, and from this beginning new approaches to science and law spread rapidly around the world, incorporating earlier cultures into the industrial and technological civilization of the present. <laughs> Fall of civilizations Civilizations have generally ended in one of two ways, either through being incorporated into another expanding civilization e.g. as ancient Egypt was incorporated into Hellenistic Greek, and subsequently Roman civilizations, or by collapse and reversion to a simpler form, as happens in what are called Dark Ages, there have been many explanations put forward for the collapse of civilization. Some focus on historical examples, and others on general theory. Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah influenced theories of the analysis, growth and decline of the Islamic civilization. He suggested repeated invasions from nomadic peoples limited development and led to social collapse. Edward Gibbon's work The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire was a well-known and detailed analysis of the fall of Roman civilization. Gibbon suggested the final act of the collapse of Rome was the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453 CE. For Gibbon. The decline of Rome was the natural and inevitable effect of immoderate greatness. Prosperity ripened the principle of decay, the cause of the destruction multiplied with the extent of conquest, and, as soon as time or accident had removed the artificial supports, the stupendous fabric yielded to the pressure of its own weight. The story of the ruin is simple and obvious, and instead of inquiring why the Roman Empire was destroyed, we should rather be surprised that it has subsisted for so long." Theodor Mommsen in his History of Rome suggested Rome collapsed with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in 476 CE and he also tended towards a biological analogy of genesis, growth, senescence, collapse, and decay. Oswald Spengler, in his Decline of the West rejected Petrarch's chronological division, and suggested that there had been only eight mature civilizations. Growing cultures, he argued, tend to develop into imperialistic civilizations, which expand and ultimately collapse, with democratic forms of government ushering in plutocracy and ultimately imperialism. Arnold J. Toynbee in his A Study of History suggested that there had been a much larger number of civilizations, including a small number of arrested civilizations, and that all civilizations tended to go through the cycle identified by Momsen. The cause of the fall of a civilization occurred when a cultural elite became a parasitic elite, leading to the rise of internal and external proletariats. Joseph Tainter in The Collapse of Complex Societies suggested that there were diminishing returns to complexity, due to which, as states achieved a maximum permissible complexity, they would decline when further increases actually produced a negative return. Tainter suggested that Rome achieved this figure in the 2nd century CE. Jared Diamond in his 2005 book Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed suggests five major reasons for the collapse of 41 studied cultures, environmental damage, such as deforestation and soil erosion, climate change, dependence upon long-distance trade for needed resources, increasing levels of internal and external violence, such as war or invasion, and societal responses to internal and environmental problems. Peter Turchin in his Historical Dynamics and Andrei Korotayev et al., in their introduction to social macrodynamics, secular cycles, and millennial trends suggest a number of mathematical models describing collapse of agrarian civilizations. For example, the basic logic of Turchin's fiscal demographic Model can be outlined as follows, during the initial phase of a sociodemographic cycle we observe relatively high levels of per capita production and consumption, which leads not only to relatively high population growth rates, but also to relatively high rates of surplus production. As a result, during this phase the population can afford to pay taxes without great problems, the taxes are quite easily collectible, and the population growth is accompanied by the growth of state revenues. During the intermediate phase, the increasing overpopulation leads to the decrease of per capita production and consumption levels, it becomes more and more difficult to collect taxes, and state revenues stop growing, whereas the state expenditures grow due to the growth of the population controlled by the state. As a result, during this phase the state starts experiencing considerable fiscal problems. 
During the final pre-collapse phases the overpopulation leads to further decrease of per capita production, the surplus production further decreases, state revenues shrink, but the state needs more and more resources to control the growing though with lower and lower rates population. Eventually this leads to famines, epidemics, state breakdown, and demographic and civilization collapse Peter Turchin. Historical Dynamics Princeton University Press, 2003-121-127, Andrei Korotayev et al. Secular Cycles and Millennial Trends. Moscow, Russian Academy of Sciences, 2006. Peter Heather argues in his book The Fall of the Roman Empire, A New History of Rome and the Barbarians that this civilization did not end for moral or economic reasons, but because centuries of contact with barbarians across the frontier generated its own nemesis by making them a much more sophisticated and dangerous adversary. The fact that Rome needed to generate ever greater revenues to equip and re-equip armies that were for the first time repeatedly defeated in the field, led to the dismemberment of the empire. Although this argument is specific to Rome, it can also be applied to the Asiatic Empire of the Egyptians, to the Han and Tang dynasties of China, to the Muslim Abbasid Caliphate and others. Brian Ward Perkins, in his book The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization, shows the real horrors associated with the collapse of a civilization for the people who suffer its effects, unlike many revisionist historians who downplay this. The collapse of complex society meant that even basic plumbing disappeared from the continent for 1,000 years. Similar Dark Age collapses are seen with the Late Bronze Age collapse in the eastern Mediterranean, the collapse of the Maya, on Easter Island and elsewhere. Arthur Demarest argues in Ancient Maya, the rise and fall of a rainforest civilization, using a holistic perspective to the most recent evidence from archaeology, paleoecology, and epigraphy, that no one explanation is sufficient but that a series of erratic, complex events, including loss of soil fertility, drought and rising levels of internal and external violence led to the disintegration of the courts of Mayan kingdoms, which began a spiral of decline and decay. He argues that the collapse of the Maya has lessons for civilization today. Jeffrey A. McNeely has recently suggested that, "...a review of historical evidence shows that past civilizations have tended to overexploit their forests, and that such abuse of important resources has been a significant factor in the decline of the overexploiting society." Thomas Homer Dixon in The Upside of Down, Catastrophe, Creativity, and the Renewal of Civilization, where he considers that the fall in the energy return on investments. The energy expended to energy yield ratio is central to limiting the survival of civilizations. The degree of social complexity is associated strongly, he suggests, with the amount of disposable energy environmental, economic and technological systems allow. When this amount decreases civilizations either have to access new energy sources or they will collapse. Felix Konechny in his work, On the Plurality of Civilizations, calls his study the science on civilizations. Civilizations fall not because they must or there exist some cyclical or a biological lifespan. There still exist two ancient civilizations, Brahmin Hindu and Chinese, which are not ready to fall any time soon. Konechny claimed that civilizations cannot be mixed into hybrids, an inferior civilization when given equal rights within a highly developed civilization will overcome it. One of Konechny's claims in his study on civilizations is that, a person cannot be civilized in two or more ways, without falling into what he calls an abcivilized state, as in abnormal. He also stated that when two or more civilizations exist next to one another and as long as they are vital, they will be in an existential combat imposing its own method of organizing social life upon the other, absorbing alien method of organizing social life. That is civilization and giving it equal rights yields a process of decay and decomposition. Topic. Future. Political scientist Samuel Huntington, has argued that the defining characteristic of the 21st century will be a clash of civilizations. According to Huntington, conflicts between civilizations will supplant the conflicts between nation-states and ideologies that characterized the 19th and 20th centuries. These views have been strongly challenged by others like Edward Said, Mohamed Asadi and Amartya Senator Ronald Inglehart and Pippa Norris have argued that the true clash of civilizations 
Between the Muslim world and the West is caused by the Muslim rejection of the West's more liberal sexual values, rather than a difference in political ideology, although they note that this lack of tolerance is likely to lead to an eventual rejection of true democracy. In identity and violence send questions if people should be divided along the lines of a supposed civilization, defined by religion and culture only. He argues that this ignores the many others' identities that make up people and leads to a focus on differences. Cultural historian Morris Berman suggests in Dark Ages America, the end of empire that in the corporate consumerist United States, the very factors that once propelled it to greatness extreme individualism, territorial and economic expansion, and the pursuit of material wealth have pushed the United States across a critical threshold where collapse is inevitable. Politically associated with overreach, and as a result of the environmental exhaustion and polarization of wealth between rich and poor, he concludes the current system is fast arriving at a situation where continuation of the existing system saddled with huge deficits and a hollowed out economy is physically, socially, economically and politically impossible. Although developed in much more depth, Berman's thesis is similar in some ways to that of urban planner, Jane Jacobs who argues that the five pillars of United States culture are in serious decay, community and family, higher education, the effective practice of science, taxation and government, and the self-regulation of the learned professions. The corrosion of these pillars, Jacobs argues, is linked to societal ills such as environmental crisis, racism, and the growing gulf between rich and poor. Some environmental scientists also see the world entering a planetary phase of civilization, characterized by a shift away from independent, disconnected nation states to a world of increased global connectivity with worldwide institutions, environmental challenges, economic systems, and consciousness. In an attempt to better understand what a planetary phase of civilization might look like in the current context of declining natural resources and increasing consumption, the Global Scenario Group used scenario analysis to arrive at three archetypal futures, barbarization, in which increasing conflicts result in either a fortress world or complete societal breakdown, conventional worlds, in which market forces or policy reform slowly precipitate more sustainable practices, and a great transition, in which either the sum of fragmented eco communalism movements add up to a sustainable world or globally coordinated efforts and initiatives result in a new sustainability paradigm. Cultural critic and author Derek Jensen argues that modern civilization is directed towards the domination of the environment and humanity itself in an intrinsically harmful, unsustainable, and self-destructive fashion. Defending his definition both linguistically and historically, he defines civilization as a culture that both leads to and emerges from the growth of cities. With cities defined as people living more or less permanently in one place in densities high enough to require the routine importation of food and other necessities of life. This need for civilizations to import ever more resources, he argues, stems from their over-exploitation and diminution of their own local resources. Therefore, civilizations inherently adopt imperialist and expansionist policies and, to maintain these, highly militarized, hierarchically structured, and coercion-based cultures and lifestyles. The Kardashev scale classifies civilizations based on their level of technological advancement, specifically measured by the amount of energy a civilization is able to harness. The Kardashev scale makes provisions for civilizations far more technologically advanced than any currently known to exist see also, Civilizations and the Future and Space Civilization. Examples of Civilizations See also Notes and references Bibliography <references> <references> Ankerl, Guy 2000, 2000. Global Communication Without Universal Civilization. Inu Societal Research. Volume. 1. Coexisting Contemporary Civilizations, Arabo-Muslim, Bharati, Chinese, and Western. Geneva, Inu Press. ISBN 978-2-88155-004-1. Brinton, Crane, et al., 1984. A History of Civilization, Prehistory to 1715 6th ed. Englewood Cliffs, N.J., Prentice Hall. ISBN 978-0-13-389866-8. Casson, Lionel Ships and Seafaring in Ancient Times. 
London, British Museum Press. ISBN 978-0-7141-1735-5. Chisholm, Jane, Anne Millard Early Civilization, Illis. Ian Jackson. London, Usborne. ISBN 978-1-58086-022-2. Colkett, Martin, Marius Jansen, Isao Kumakura Cultural Atlas of Japan. New York, Facts on File. ISBN 978-0-8160-1927-4. Drews, Robert The End of the Bronze Age, Changes in Warfare and the Catastrophe ca. 1200 BC. Princeton, Princeton University Press. ISBN 978-0-691-04811-6. Edie, Maitland A. The Sea Traders. New York, Time Life Books. ISBN 978-0-7054-0060-2. Fairservice, Walter A., Jr. The Threshold of Civilization, An Experiment in Prehistory. New York, Scribner. ISBN 978-0-684-12775-0. Fernandez Armesto, Felipe. 2000. Civilizations. London, Macmillan. ISBN 978-0-333-90171-7. Ferriel, Arthur. The Origins of War, From the Stone Age to Alexander the Great. New York, Thames and Hudson. ISBN 978-0-500-25093-8. Fitzgerald, C.P. The Horizon History of China. New York, American Heritage. ISBN 978-0-8281-0005-2. Fuller, J.F.C. A Military History of the Western World, 3 vols. New York, Funk and Wagnalls, From the Earliest Times to the Battle of Lepanto. ISBN 0-306-80304-6 From the Defeat of the Spanish Armada to the Battle of Waterloo. ISBN 0-306-80305-4 From the American Civil War to the End of World War II. ISBN 0-306-80306-2 Gowlett, John. 1984. Ascent to Civilization. London, Collins. ISBN 978 0 00 217090 1. Hawks, Jaquetta. Dawn of the Gods. London, Chateau and Windus. ISBN 978 0 7011 1332 2. Hawks, Jaquetta, David Trump. 1976. The Atlas of Early Man. London, Dorling Kindersley. ISBN 978-0-312-09746-2. Hicks, Jim. The Empire Builders. New York, Time Life Books. Hicks, Jim. The Persians. New York, Time Life Books. Johnson, Paul. A History of the Jews. London, Weidenfeld and Nicholson. ISBN 978-0-297-79091-4. Jensen, Derek. 2006. Endgame. New York, Seven Stories Press. ISBN 978-1-58322-730-5. Kepi, Lawrence. The Making of the Roman Army, From Republic to Empire. Totowa, N.J., Barnes & Noble. ISBN 978-0-389-20447-3. Korotayev, Andre, World Religions and Social Evolution of the Old World Oikumene Civilizations, A Cross-Cultural Perspective. Lewiston, N.Y., Edwin Mellon Press, 2004. ISBN 0-7734-6310-0 Creighton, Nikolai. Archaeological Criteria of Civilization. Social Evolution and History, Vol. 5, No. 1, 2006, 89-108. ISSN 1681-4363. Lansing, Elizabeth. The Sumerians, Inventors and Builders. New York, McGraw-Hill. ISBN 978-0-07-036357-1. Lee, Key Bake. A New History of Korea, Trans. Edward W. Wagner, with Edward J. Schultz. Cambridge, Harvard University Press. 
ISBN 978-0-674-61575-5. Nam, Andrew C. A Panorama of Five Thousand Years, Korean History. Elizabeth, New Jersey, Halim International. ISBN 978-0-930878-23-8. Oliphant, Margaret The Atlas of the Ancient World, Charting the Great Civilizations of the Past. London, Ebury. ISBN 978-0-09-177040-2. Rogerson, John Atlas of the Bible. New York, Infobase Publishing. ISBN 978-0-8160-1206-0. Sandal, Roger The Culture Cult, Designer Tribalism and Other Essays. Boulder, Colorado, Westview. ISBN 978-0-8133-3863-7. Sansom, George A History of Japan, to 1334. Stanford, Stanford University Press. ISBN 978-0-8047-0523-3. Southworth, John Van Dunn The Ancient Fleets, The Story of Naval Warfare Under Oars, 2600 BC to 1597 AD New York, Twain. Thomas, Hugh An Unfinished History of the World Rev. Ed. London, Pan. ISBN 978-0-330-26458-7. Yap, Yang, Arthur Cotterell 1975. The Early Civilization of China. New York, Putnam. ISBN 978-0-399-11595-0. Yurdusev, A. Nuri, International Relations and the Philosophy of History, A Civilizational Approach Basingstoke, Palgrave Macmillan, 2003. Topic. External links The Dictionary Definition of Civilization at Wiktionary Quotations Related to Civilization at Wikiquote BBC on Civilization Top 10 Oldest Civilizations <laughs>